I, I think you're really going to like this word this morning. I really feel like you're going to be envisioned this morning. Who's ready? Who's ready? You know, uh, I've had this thought in my mind for a number of months, number of months, and, and God has been doing so much in our midst the last few years. And, you know, I, I flash back to when I was in youth ministry. I got saved when I was 19. And I grew up in the youth ministry in my home church. And I remember, you know, when you're in youth ministry, you like to make fun of people. <laughs> Wave at me if you know what I'm talking about. You make fun of your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we, would, we did that. Amen. We should repent. We did that. But I remember we would see like a young leader, a young person walking around, like trying to be holy. Imagine they're trying to be holy. Now, aren't we supposed to be holy? And they're trying to do it right. They're trying to be holy. They're trying to serve the Lord with the righteousness. And then we would see that person and we would say, oh, that person's so heavenly minded. They're no earthly good. And that line really sparked something in me some time ago. I have a question for you, Victor Art San Diego. Can the church of 2023 walk in a spirit of prayer but still be productive? Can there be Davids in the church who still build like Solomon? Men and women that have a heart after God that are desperate and hungry for God in prayer, but yet have the heart and the mind of Solomon to build his house. In, in 2023, in, in this new season of church, in this new era, can there be a Paul who had a heavenly vision, who went up to the third dimension and saw things in the heavenly realms can there be a Paul that has a heavenly vision but also has an earthly vision? Yes. See, when I look at the church of Acts, the book of Acts, I see a church that didn't choose power over progress. And they didn't choose progress over power. I see a church in the book of Acts that said power and progress go hand in hand. Yes. I don't know who I came to talk to this morning. But you don't have to let go of your power to have progress. You don't got to compromise your power. You don't got to compromise your prayer life. Hmm. You don't got to compromise your devotion just to fit in. I believe power and progress go together. Can anybody praise God that we, this year in 2023, we, we, we can go with power and progress. In the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 19... We find a church that had power and progress. We find a church that when you really look at it, they were walking in, in a mega spirit. They were walking in a larger than life spirit. Now, in Acts eleven nineteen, 19, it reads like this. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Look at what they did. Preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them, someone say some of them. These were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. These were Greek men. These were men who were not Jews. Some of them. They began preaching to the Hellenists, preaching to the Gentiles, preaching to the Greeks. They went outside the box. Come on, somebody. Preaching the Lord. And it says, and the Lord was with them. And here's the part I really want you to hear. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. You know what amazes me about the early church? What amazes me is that whatever God does, he does it in a big way. Whatever God does, he does it in a big way. If you read the book of Acts, you'll find that wherever they went and the Lord was using them, great things were happening. There's certain parts of the scripture where it says there were not a few miracles. There were many miracles. There's other portions of scripture that say a great many miracles turned their lives over to God. There's other parts of the book of Acts where it says many of the religious leaders begin to change. Maybe you're that religious leader. No, I'm just kidding. 
Many great crowds, great numbers gathered on the day of Pentecost. Many people were there who were filled in the spirit. What does that say to me is that we serve a big God. We serve a big God that doesn't desire just to do small things. But how many know when God moves, he always moves in a big way. I've been thinking about this word that you hear a lot in, in the church world. It's the, it's the word mega. Somebody say mega. mega. Whatever God does, he does in a mega way. Amen. And I'm coming into this year, 2023, and I'm saying to myself as your pastor, I'm, I'm saying, Lord, make me mega. I think that should be everybody's, everybody's mindset. To say, make me mega, mega is for me. Now, when I say the word mega, it, it causes pause in some people. When, when you say that word, some people say, oh, I don't know. You know, it sounds like ego. Who's with me? It sounds like ego. You know, I think sometimes we think about mega churches. Sometimes we think of, you know, mega preachers. And, and, and let me tell you something about mega Mega is not the picture of a preacher. Mega is the picture of a people. It's mega people. This is what I believe our calling is as a church. I've struggled with it for some years. There's been some years. I've been pastoring now 15 years, almost 16 years, actually. And, uh, you know, I've always felt this in my spirit. But recently, a friend of mine who is a fellow pastor, one of our elders in our ministry, we were discussing this whole concept of doing big things for God. And, you know, I've always struggled with that part. And he says, you know, the way I think of it is mega. He, he tells me, he goes, you know, the word mega, it, it, it just simply means more. More. Why, why would the Lord want to make us big so we could be big and have a big ego? No. He wants to make us big so that we could do more for him. See, this is what we see in the Antioch church in Acts chapter 11. I want to take a moment to talk to you about some of the spiritual qualities of a mega people. Some of the spiritual qualities of a mega ministry. See, the first thing we see about Antioch is that they were diverse. There was a diversity. Everybody say diversity. I tell you, I believe the church ought to be diverse. I think the church ought to be diverse culturally. I don't think that only Mexicans go to heaven. I believe the church ought to look like heaven. I think that when we get to heaven, there's not going to be a Mexican corner. There's not going to be an African-American corner. There's not going to be a Dominican corner. There's not going to be a Chinese corner. We're going to be worshiping the Lord with one voice. Come on, give him praise. We're going to be worshiping the Lord in one voice. And I think the church ought to be diverse. I think the church ought to be diverse culture. I think the church ought to be diverse economically. I think the church ought to be diverse when it comes to gifts and talents. Come on, help me preach a little. I, I feel that the church has got to... Be diverse in gift, in ability, in talent. I think the church ought to be diverse in age. Come on, somebody. How many feel like you want to be a part of a church that's diverse, a church like that? Because that's what the church was in the book of Acts. They were diverse. They were a church that was born into diversity. The second thing we sing about this church is that they were a church that was born out of great adversity. Great adversity. The Bible says those who were scattered after the persecution that arose after Stephen was stoned. You, you know the story that Stephen, the young disciple, was stoned because he stood up to re religious leaders. And the church was scattered because of diversity. L let me say something to those of you that have been through some stuff. How many of you could wave at me and say, I've been through some stuff? How many could wave at me and say, last year was rough. Last two years have been rough. Come on, wave at me like you're being honest. Yeah, that's the church I like. I like honest church. But let me tell you this, is that which did not kill you only made you stronger. You know, some of you here have been through some heavy trials. 
You've lost loved ones. You've been persecuted. You've been through financial trouble. You've been through sickness. Some of you have even beat cancer. And guess what? It couldn't take you out. What did not kill you only made you stronger. Could this be the moment that fear has got to go? Could this be the moment where God is going to use you in a way that you could not imagine? It's amazing how God uses life's adversities to position us for great things. I, 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 I choose to believe that this year. I choose to believe that this is going to be the year of great things in my life. I'm going to wait on you. Come on, I'm going to wait on you. I choose to believe that this is going to be the year of great things. I've been through too much. I've seen too much. I've experienced. You ought to shout and give him praise by faith. You ought to praise him by faith. This is going to be a great year. And I'm not saying that just to pump you up. I'm saying it because you've been tested. You've been through the storm. You've been through the battle, and you're still serving the Lord. Imagine a whole mega church formed. Ooh, I'm getting excited. Imagine a whole mega church that was formed through adversity. Where everybody had a story. Where everybody, oh, can you see it? Everybody had a, a, a testimony to tell. Everybody had something to say about how God brought them through. Let me tell you, man, the size of your problem is going to be the size of your promotion. This is our year for mega. I've discovered this, that great impact is not the result of inspiration. Hear this part, please. Please hear this part. Great impact is not the re result of inspiration. Have you noticed that inspiration is very fleeting? Have you noticed that? Some days you wake up inspired. Some days you wake up like, I feel good today. And then the next one you wake up, you're like, I don't feel so good today. See, great impact is not the result of inspiration. Great impact is the result of desperation. I'm here to unlock something in your life right now. It's, you're not always going to feel inspired, but something happens. Let me tell you something about a desperate person. Because you've got desperate people all over San Diego. You can go downtown, and you see a homeless guy or a homeless girl. They're out there, and something's a little off. We, we pray for them. We want to see God do something in their life. But you know <laughs> they're dangerous sometimes. Oh, Lord. And that danger comes from a spirit of desperation. What would happen if the people of God got desperate? What would happen if some of you got so desperate that you went into this year and you said I shall not be denied my family is going to be saved my marriage is going to be transformed I'm going to come on can I get some desperate people in this place desperate people are dangerous imagine an entire church that made an impact out of their desperation that, that was Paul the apostle he said, woe to me if I preach not the gospel. Woe to me. See, get this in your mind, brothers and sisters. Get this in your mind. We don't get to do this. We have to do this. We don't get to do the ministry. Yes, it's a joy. Amen. But you get to a level in your life. You get to a level in your leadership. You get to a level in your marriage. You say, I got to I gotta do this thing. God has brought me too far by faith. I've overcome too many mountains. I, I got to keep on going and keep on building. Uh, can I get at least five people to say, I know what you're talking about, pastor. I don't get to do it. I got to do it. I got to do it so my kids can be saved. I've got to do it to keep that fire burning in my legacy. Tell your neighbor, we got to do it.
Can you, can you tell I believe this thing? And the third thing we see about this church, Antioch, is not only were they a church of diversity and born out of adversity, but this is the part. They were a church of publicity. Remember, even Moses couldn't stay a secret. Jesus couldn't stay a secret. Don't, don't think for a moment that you could stay a secret. Don't think for a moment that you're going to be able to hide your blessing forever. This year, someone's going to find you out. They say, oh, you're the one that's been praying for me. You're the one that God is moving in. You're the one that's experiencing breakthrough. You're not going to be hidden this year. This is your year to come out of the cave. This is your year to come out of the closet. Do not be ashamed. I said do not be ashamed of what the Lord is doing in your life. You, you ought to get to the, to the rooftops and shout it to everybody that Jesus is alive, that Jesus healed me. You're not going to be able to hide it this year. Tell your neighbor, you're not going to be able to hide it. Mm -mm, no way. No way. This church in Antioch could not remain hidden. They developed a reputation that the Holy Spirit was active and alive in their midst. They developed a reputation. They developed a reputation that the Holy Ghost was moving. In fact, the reputation, news got out. Wherever God's moving, news is going to get out. Let me tell you something. You don't need YouTube for news to get out. You don't need Instagram. Word will get out. And, and word got out from there, 280 miles north to the mother church to Jerusalem, to Peter and them, and James and them. They said there's a city in Antioch. Something's happening. So they look for someone, a disciple, a leader by the name of Barnabas. Who's heard of Barnabas? I said, okay, Barnabas, go, go down there. Get on the trolley. Go down there. <laughs> and check out what's happening. Make sure nothing weird's going on. So the Bible says that Barnabas went down there to inspect the work. And what Barnabas saw is that in Antioch, in that setting, there was no limit on the Holy Spirit. There was no limit. Look at your and say, no limits. Mm, Lord, no limits, Lord. No more limits. In Acts eleven twenty three, 23, it says, when he came and seen the grace of God, this is Barnabas now. When he went to that church and he saw the grace of God, it says he was glad. And he encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, he says, continue with the Lord. They, they were, what, what, what Barnabas saw in that church is he saw that God was there. Do you hear me? God was there. He didn't criticize them. He didn't come against them. <laughs> and then he went down there. And the Bible says he was glad, and he saw, and he said, ooh. He didn't tell him stop. He said, continue with the Lord. He said, continue to walk in that mega spirit. Continue to keep moving with the Holy Ghost. How many want to move with the Holy Ghost? How many say yes, Pastor? See, he saw that, number one, write this down, he saw that they were glowing. Somebody say glowing. Yeah. Not glitter. <laughs> he saw that the Holy Ghost was on him. When, when the Holy Spirit is on you, there's a glow. When God is moving in your life, there's a glow. When you're breaking through, there's a glow. He saw that they had been ignited by the Holy Spirit, that they had been filled with vision and purpose. They, they possessed, look at this, they possessed something intangible. Something intangible. What is an intangible? What is an intangible? I know it's a big word. Like I, I, I don't want to look at my phone and Google it. Break it down, Pastor. Here it comes. 
The, the best way to describe an intangible is you can't smell it. You can't see it. You can't hear it. But you can feel it. You could feel it. Walking with my pastor, Pastor Sonny, for almost 40 years, 30, almost 40 years now, almost all my life, walking with him and Sister Julie, you know, I, I couldn't tell you what it was to be around them. All I could tell you is that I always felt something. I always felt something special. I always felt, come on, some of you remember when he was pastoring here, you know, you, you come into the church, and let me tell you what people who come into the church, and hear me leaders, hear me. That's why you got to guard your spirit. That they, they come in here, you know, they, f <laughs> they can't explain it. You know, you ask them, did you like it? And they can either tell you one or two things. Either they didn't like it or they liked it. What did you like about it? Was it, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Was it the music? It was good. It was the preaching. It was all right. It, the chair was nice and soft. <laughs> but what did you like about it? I don't know what I liked about it. All I know is I felt something. I felt something. What did they feel? They felt the power of the Holy Spirit getting a hold of their life. They had God. They were glowing with power. See, that's why we as a church, we've got to stay in prayer. We, we've got to stay in prayer. How many feel like we've got to stay in prayer? We've got to stay fasting. We've got to stay on our knees. We've, because what revival is, is when revival wakes up, not the sinner. Before the sinner can be awake, the saints got to be awake. You might be here, you've been serving the Lord for a while. You know, maybe you're in and out of the house of God. Not this year. No, 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 not this year. This is the year you wake up. This is the year the Holy Spirit ar arrests you. This is the year the Holy Spirit grabs you. This is the year the Holy Ghost wraps his loving arms around you and says, listen, son, listen, daughter. It's time to glow. It's time to wake up. I want to use your life. This church was glowing. Also, this church was growing. What did Barnabas see when he went? He saw a church that was alive. He saw a church that was burning like fire. And he saw a church that was growing. You know, in, in times of revival, never is the church more like the church of the book of Acts, the early church. What, what made this church so powerful? Why were they growing? Why were they enlarging? I'll tell you why. Because they were working in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. They were working in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer. Lord, this year I want to work in cooperation with you. I don't want to push against you. You say go, I'm not going to fight it. You say give, I'm not going to fight it. You say serve, I'm not going to fight it. You say change, I'm not going to fight it. Come on, help me. Help me. Come on, leaders, help me. Don't be sophisticated. Come on. The Holy Spirit, I'm going to partner with you. Not you, not you with me. I'm going to partner with you. I'm going to cooperate with you. And, and they were growing because they were not only cooperating with the Holy Spirit, but they were cooperating with each other. They were cooperating and working together. That's what makes the church powerful. Is when people are united. We, we see that they were united in everything they did. I'll tell you, if you can unite with people of God, you can unite with anyone. Yeah, if you can unite here, you can unite with your spouse again. You can unite with those unsaved kids. What we find about this, about this church is that they did everything together. Everything together. They showed us how to do it. It's simple. So you want to be mega? You want to make an impact? They showed us how to do it. They were called together. They gathered together, they sang together, they suffered together, they prayed together, they were fused and joined together, they were tested together, they went to war together, they talked together, 
They took counsel together. They lived together. They learned together. They wept together. They rejoiced together. They rested together. They worked together. They stood together. Tell me to stop when you want me to stop. They, 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 they stood together. They grew together. They bowed before God together. They sprung up and bounced back together. They flowed together. They went forth together. They planted their seed together. They reaped the harvest together. And they changed the world together. They, they were growing because they were together. They, nothing, nothing hindered the Holy Spirit. Their growth was not only numerical, but understand me, brothers and sisters, their growth was spiritual. It, it was spiritual. This is a place... This was a place for spiritual growth. That's what the church has got to be. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, we, we, we shouldn't be walking to church. We should be running to church. There was a time when they would put the clock. I'm looking at the clock right here. There was a time when they would put the clock on the outside of the church. And when the bell rung, the people knew it was time to get to church. What's the problem with the church? We took the clock off the outside and we put it on the inside. There was a time where people wanted to know what time church started, but we're living a day where people want to know what type church ends. We need a people. I said we need a people that want to grow spiritually. We need a people that say, God, I'm not going to move until you're done moving. How many think that's where we got to go? They had people who were responding to the message, responding to the altar calls, responding to the preacher. They took what the preacher said seriously. They took what the preacher said seriously as if it was God himself. The Bible says they were dedicated to the teaching of the apostles. They gave themselves over to learning and to growing. And you know what God did through that? He made them into disciples. He made them into disciples. Someone said the great tragedy of Christianity today is that many are called to decision, but few are called to discipleship. And I'll tell you, something will happen to us when we learn what it means, truly means to be a disciple. Should I tell you what a disciple is? You ready for this? Are you enjoying this message as much as me? I'm liking this one. What is a disciple? A believer goes to church. A disciple is the church. A believer is a listener. A disciple is a doer of God's word. A believer believes in God. A disciple depends on God. A believer has an emotion for God. A disciple has a devotion to God. A believer lets himself be counseled. A disciple lets himself be formed. Woo, my goodness. A believer is a consumer. The disciple is committed. The believer is called. The disciple is chosen. The believer gives a donation. The disciple gives a tithe. My God, this is... Wow. Look at this. A believer is willing to live for Jesus. A disciple is willing to die for Jesus. This church was not only glowing, but they were growing. And, and the third thing we see here, and I'm almost done, they were going. They were going. When, when you're glowing and you're growing, you can't help but to grow. I mean, to go. You know, when you think of a church like the church in Antioch, or you think of a church that's mega, that's making a, a mega impact, you always think of a church that's marked by faith, willingness, and generosity, a, a willingness to give. You know, mega churches are more than enough churches. They've tapped into the God of more than enough. 
Mega churches aren't asking for help. They are the help. They're the ones that God is using, not just to impact families and impact their community. These are the churches that are actually impacting the world. And in Acts chapter 13, we see that where the Holy Ghost was moving and the Holy Spirit was active, that how many know whenever God starts moving, he starts doing things? And in Acts chapter 13, it's right here that the Bible says the Holy Spirit said to the people, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas. I find it so amazing that Barnabas, two chapters earlier, left his home church to visit Antioch. You go two chapters later to 13, and you find out that Barnabas never went home. He said, I'm not getting out of this fire. They had fire in Jerusalem, but it's nothing compared to the fire that's happening in Antioch. And he found himself there, and he never left the church until the Holy Spirit said, Separate unto me Barnabas and this young upstart disciple by the name of Paul, because I'm going to use their life. And I came to tell some of you that just started coming, keep on coming, because one day the Holy Ghost is going to call your name. One day the Holy Spirit's going to say, I've got something very special for you, young man or young woman. And as you press into God, you better believe he's not going to let you stay comfortable. Nothing more exciting than answering the call of God. There's nothing more exciting than serving the Lord. I've done a lot of things in my life. I've done a lot of things. I've been to all kinds of concerts and football. I saw Michael Jackson in concert, boy. So you can't say nothing to me. I've seen Michael Jackson in concert. I've seen them all. But there ain't nothing more exciting than preaching the word. There's nothing more exciting than being a vessel for the Holy Ghost. Can anybody stand as a witness that once Jesus started using you, something came alive? This is a church in the book of Acts where God, look, look at to me, listen to me, that God was, he was mending people, he was blending people, and he was sending people. You might be here this morning, you feel a little bit broken, you feel a little bit messed up. Oh, you're not going to stay like that here. The Lord is going to put you back together. He's going to heal your body. He's going to heal your mind. He's going to mend you. And then when he's done mending you, he's going to blend you with some people. And he's going to bring you to son next to somebody. And then after he's done blending you, you better get ready because he might send you. This church is glowing, growing, and going. Be seated. Last point. And before I get to this last point, I understand the season the world is in. How I many know we're in, a, we're in a heavy season? How many know we're surrounded by nothing but bad news? Say something to me. But understand, God's not shocked by any of it. Understand me that no matter what bad news you're surrounded by, guess what? God's got a plan. He sure does. He's got a big plan. He's got a mega plan. I, I believe that even though there's new changes and new challenges, God is raising up new champions. New champions. Don't you realize that you might be the one that's going to bring that whole change? Do you realize that? Do you realize that the Lord sees something in you that you don't see in yourself? I never saw myself preaching. And I'm not saying everybody's going to become a preacher. I think some of you will. I'm not saying everybody's going to become a worship leader. Some of you could. I'm not going to say everyone's going to become a leader. But I think, I believe everyone can. But, you, but you've got to understand that God sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. And the reason I'm here today is because somebody, my pastor, some key men in my life throughout the years partnered with the Holy Spirit. And they looked upon a young man like me, and they said, this boy's raw. This boy's from the street. This boy comes from a broken family. This boy has oddities and, and, and weird things, and, you know, he don't know how to talk, and he don't know how to behave. But God has something special 
for his life. And they partner with the Holy Spirit. And God used them to pull the potential out of my life. And what I'm saying is that if God could do it for me, then why in the world can't God do it for you? As I bring this to a close today, did you receive this word? I want you to say this with me. Say, make me mega. Say it one more time. Say, make me mega. That's God's plan for you. Let me tell you that mega means two things. And I think, it, I think we should hear this. Mega means large amount, great amount, size. But I did a little bit deeper study on mega. And I came to find that the word mega means emphasis. Everybody say emphasis. Very powerful if you can grab this. I hope you all can grab this. Whenever you use the word mega, you put it before another word. Like when you go to McDonald's. You say, make it mega, mega, mega meal, mega Big Mac, people. Lord, deliver us from mega meals. Just, just. <laughs> but the very word mega, the purpose of that word is to bring emphasis to a thing. There's an emphasis with the Holy Spirit. This is good. There's an emphasis. When, when Barnabas went to Antioch, he had come out of Jerusalem, but he goes to Antioch and he stays there and he encourages him to go forward. Why? Because he says, there's an emphasis here. For some reason, the Holy Spirit is emphasizing himself here. Did you catch it? For some reason, the Lord has chosen this place to pour out his mega, to pour out his emphasis. And as I was looking at that, I said, whoa, God. Could it be that we're supposed to hang out in your emphasis? This is so good. I'm like learning as I'm preaching. Yeah, because he's here every time we get together. And, and I, could it be that you're saying, don't leave the emphasis, Al, Georgina? Stay in the emphasis. Because if you stay in the emphasis, everything about you will become mega. If you stay in the emphasis, your life will become mega. Your family will become mega. Your gifts will become mega. Your money will become mega. Wow. Why them? Why that church? Why us? They were glowing. They were growing. They were going. They had the mega. Why was God there? I think it's because of the fourth point, which is the most important point. They were groaning. They weren't going on inspiration. They were going by way of desperation. It's like Jacob. He sent all his stuff over the fort of Jabbok, and he wrestled with God all night. <laughs> and the Lord even broke his hip, and he said, enough. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. 
I will not let you go until you bless me. It's like the woman with issue of blood. She spent all she had on doctors and she had this issue of blood and she tried everything known to man to be healed and she could not be healed. She's at the place of bankruptcy, at the place of utter brokenness, but she hears Jesus is coming through town. And she's, and this is it, man. This is groaning because when you're groaning, you don't talk to people, you talk to you. And she said to herself, she said to herself, if I could only touch the hem of his garments, I shall. Is there anybody here ready to start talking to themselves? Make me mega. Make me mega. I'm ready. guys I love you how many know I love you I love you guys but the hardest thing for me can I tell you the hardest thing about pastoring can I tell tell it to you there's things inside of me that I feel that I hear from God that I sense that I know God wants to do but the hardest thing for me is to take those things and put them inside of you. It's hard. It's hard to take what God is showing me and to put it in you. I try to live a life that's mega. My wife, we try to live lives as examples to show you it's possible. It's possible. But it, it's very difficult to take those things and to put them inside of you. And what I, I think we should do this year is just say, Lord, make me make it. And, and we should go to the Lord and come to church every week and just say, Lord, this is the year where it's going to happen. This, uh, enough is enough. I, I'm ready to attain everything that you have for my life. You got to make that choice. You got to make that decision. Where you come to that place of desperation. I want you to stand with me. Do you receive this word? I know some of you, you know, in your mind, you're a legend in your own mind, and you think you're Meg already. You know, you could be settled there. But let me tell you what's going to happen. We're going to pass you up. We will pass you up. What you call a blessing by the time God's done with us, your blessing is not going to compare to the blessings that we're going to experience. That's a reality. That's a reality. I'm, I'm going to keep growing with God. I'm going to keep pressing with God. I'm going to keep building till the Lord says you're finished. And we know that he's only going to say that the day he takes me home. There is more. And I want everything that God has for me and I want everything that God has for you. And I want everything God has for this church. We're, we're believing God right now as a church. I think we've come to the place now. I'll just say it because so much has been happening. We're, we're at a place now where we're saying, you know what? We need, we need a bigger building. Imagine. This building's 43,000 square feet and it can't house everything God's doing. We need a 100,000 square foot building. We need a stadium. I'm serious. I said, man, I've been through so much. Cancer couldn't kill me. The death of a child couldn't kill me. Losing a home couldn't kill me. Almost coming to the place of bankruptcy couldn't kill me. Backstabbers couldn't kill me. Front stabbers couldn't kill me. I'm still here. So I might as well believe God for everything that he has for us as a people. Come on, somebody. How many say, I'm with you, Pastor. I'm going for the mega in my life. But we need every person here to say, you know what, man? I'm, I'm going to turn my life over to God. And I'm going to say, Lord, this is the year for me to step into that mega spirit. Are you ready? 
Are you ready to do that? Let's pray in the spirit. Come on, start praying in the spirit right now. We, we can have power and progress. We can have prayer and progress. Start saying, yes, Lord, I'm ready to step in. Come on, if you've been comfortable, this is your moment.